I have a very long and complicated name, so that's why I go by Ali. And uh, so I'm a theorist, and uh, this, is a, this, is gonna, this is a theory paper. And uh, it's a joint work with Daron Ashramoglu and Osman Ozdaglar, my co-authors and former advisors at uh, MIT. So, um, so as the title suggests, I'll be talking about systemic risk and financial stability insights from networks. So this is a recent paper we did. Um, so let me start with a little bit of a motivation. So right after the, the financial crisis happened, people have started talking about the fact that you know, well, we, we, we now realize that, you know, um, too big to fail institutions are very important. We should take that into account when we do policy or, or regulations, or in fact, the, other, the banks should have a good understanding of that as well. But then there was also a second theme emerging at the same time about not only too big to, too big to fail institutions, but in fact, too interconnected to fail institutions. So the first one is a quote from Charles Busser, who's the president of the Philly Fed. This is in early 2009 when he basically said that uh, you know, due to the complexity and interconnectivity of today's financial markets, uh, the failure of a major counterparty can have potentially severe can lead to potentially severe disruptions in the financial network, uh, in, the, in the whole, in the fun in the whole uh, financial sector and the real economy as well. The second quote is from Janet Yellen, who's the vice chair of the Federal Reserve. She said this, she said this in last month, in uh, January of 2013, basically the same thing, that interconnectivity is not necessarily a good thing all the time. This may actually lead to the amplification of the frictions and the problems through the financial network. And in fact, this argument was even been implemented, has even been implemented in the recent regulations. So in fact, the Dodd-Frank Act, they have this, uh, this section which they refer to as single party exposure limits. Basically, they say that, well, given that we feel that these interconnections between financial institutions can be very problematic and they can amplify any problems in the financial system, well, we, maybe we should put limits on the, on the relationship between different banks or financial institutions with one another. So as you can see, this has led to, by now, a new conventional wisdom that interbank relationships may actually play an important role in the stability of the financial network. So people sort of have this understanding now. But what is not really clear is that how, how does this interbank network relationship, really the relationship between different financial institutions, can actually lead to the stability or the fragility of the financial system. So here are basically two pictures which I took from other papers. This one is from the UK, bank, UK interbank network back in 2008 for the first quarter. And this is from the Austrian uh, interbank network. So you know these look pretty complicated. Uh, and you know we don't really have a good understanding of how these structures lead to stability or fragility. So what we are really looking for is to come up with a simple theory that we can understand and parse and see whether there is anything to this conventional wisdom, this new conventional wisdom, and then you know what can policy do about it. So in fact, you can already see that there are two different themes emerging when people, policymakers, or regulators discuss this. So one thing which, has all, which, which people had already been thinking about is diversification is good. So you know, if, if banks can hedge their risk in getting into more interbank uh, relationships and they can have all these contracts with one another, well, that may actually lead to a better, a more stability because banks are able to hedge their risk and, uh, and diversify their, their portfolio. So the idea was that, you know, in fact, more, more connections are good. We should discourage it. We should deregulate the financial market so that you know, let banks decide what they want to do. Now, more recently, people say, well, not necessarily. Interconnectivity is not necessarily good. It can be actually something bad in the sense that you, know, you can think about it in terms of epidemics. So if one guy gets sick, you want to put that guy away in a small room. You don't want this guy to be in relation with others. So if you have a very highly interconnected financial system, a problem at some point can actually quickly lead to problems at other financial institutions, and a small problem can actually lead to large losses across the board. So in order to understand you know, what the tension here is, we need a simple model. But before doing that, there's also a different uh, important thing to take into account is that, well, there are many different amplification and contagion mechanisms in the financial markets. So it's not that you know, a problem at the, inter the relationship between any two banks that, let's say, are in a, are, uh, have written a contract with one another or have lent to one another is not that simple. There are many different ways that a problem at one bank can lead to a problem at the other one. 
So at least there are two ways. You can, you can categorize them in two different categories. One is direct contagion, or what people think in terms of domino effect. This is when, you know, typically caused by direct co contractual relationships between different banks. So if I owe Stefan uh, $10 million, and for whatever reason I, go, I, I default and cannot pay him, then he may not be able to pay the other banks. So in some sense, you can think about it in terms of dominoes. If one domino falls, it may actually lead to the failure of other dominoes. But this is not this direct contagion. It's not the only way to think about it. There are also in indirect relationships between different banks. So let's say I hold some assets and Stefan holds some assets, and we're not, we're not in any contract with one another. If I run into trouble and start selling my assets so that I can pay, pay my obligations or whatever, that would drive the price of the assets down that Stefan holds, and that would lead to problems at the other banks as well. So you can think, you know, that's sort of an indirect way. So first we have to pick, we have to choose which mechanism we want to look at, and then write a simple model that we can analyze. So what we do in this paper, we focus on the direct contagion mechanism, on these domino effects, and then see whether what the implications of the uh, network structure is going to be on the extent of contagion. So what we do, we write a very stylized model of interbank lending and counterparty risk. So basically, we're going to look at a collection of financial institutions, which for the simplicity, I'm just going to refer them to banks. And we're going to look at the interbank lending network. So by a network, I mean this. So I'm going to put a, put a node or a circle for each bank. And there's going to be an edge going bank from bank J to bank I with, with some weight YIJ, which is basically YIJ is the face value of the contract between bank I or bank J. So that's how much bank J owes to bank I. Okay? So this, this is going to capture the interbank uh, debt contracts, basically. And bank, banks may have some, some senior obligations as well. Now, the way we're going to analyze this, I'm going to add, we're going to see what the effect of exogenous distress at some bank going to be on the rest of the network. So basically, let's say I'm going to put some uh, stress, uh, distress at bank J. This distress may lead to the default of bank J. So bank J may not be able to, uh, to meet all its obligations to bank I. And as a result, bank I is made default as well. So basically, we're going to put some distress some point at the bank, which leads to default and then leads to contagion. Basically, these dominoes start to fall. And the quantity of interest is that how many of these domino pieces are going to fall? Basically, what the extent, we're going to look at the extent of financial contagion as a function of the structure of these interbank relations and see what leads to more contagion and what leads to less, less contagion. So, so I'm not going to give you the whole theory, but I'm going to give you two simple examples which sort of captures the essence of it. So let's look at two very simple structures. So these are obviously stylized. No interbank network looks like this. But let's look at this one, which is a very sparse one. So here, each bank is only in relation with only one other bank, whereas here, this is a very highly interconnected one, where all banks are lending to one another. Okay? And let's assume that each bank has $1 million of liquid assets. So again, very stylized numbers. I just put something I can work with. And let's say one of the banks is hit with like a 3.5 million liquidity shock. So let's assume this bank is going to hit with that, uh, with a 3.5 million liquidity shock. So effectively, it has 1 million. So I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to, at the end of the day, I'm going to have a shortfall of 2.5 million. But that means that I, I'm going to pay my creditor 2.5 million dollars less than what I had to pay him based on the face value of the contract. Now that guy is going to face a shortfall of 1.5 because he already had 1 million to, to take that. And then there's going to be a half, and then the same thing. So basically, you can see that a shock of size point, a, a negative dis a, a distress of uh, size 3.5 million is going to lead to the failure of three banks in this very simple example. Now let's look at this other world, in which banks are all highly connected to one another. And I put a similar distress, a distress of a similar size, to one of these banks. Now this bank has six other counterparts. So the losses are going to be divided by six, and, and only one-sixth of this distress is going to be going to all of those banks. So effectively, none of those banks are going to face a shortfall. They're going to face some losses, but it may, it's not going to lead to their default. So you can, as you can see, this very, very simple example, this suggests that you know, more interconnectivity, at least in this world with this model, implies more stability. Okay, so this is sort of the argument of diversification is good. 
If I have a lot of counterparties, my problems are going to be spread around, but at much smaller values, and all of them are going to be able to absorb the, the, the distress, basically. But now let's look at a different example. So again, each bank has $1 million of liquid assets, but now the size of this distress, rather than being 3.5, is 8.5. So now this bank, to begin with, the distress, originally distressed bank, is going to face a shock of minus 7.5. <coughs> So that's the, that's the amount of shortfall. And this, this number is going to be divided by 6. So minus 7.5 divided by 6 is bigger than the 1 million that each one of these banks can absorb. And in fact, this would lead to the collapse of the whole financial system. Right? So all of these banks are now have a, have a negative shortfall effect. So now, had I been cutting this network from the middle, I would have been able to save all these banks. So in this case, which with a much larger shock, which is much larger distress to begin with, the financial, systems become, the financial system becomes a lot more uh, unstable. But whereas if I had a disconnected or basically a sparsely connected financial network, things would have been a lot more stable. So this basically suggests that under certain conditions, more interconnectivity implies fragility. That's exactly, this is sort of the epidemic point of view that people have been talking about. So more generally, the result that we get um, is that you know, there is a certain size of distress for which if the size of the distress is below that threshold, more interconnectivity leads to stability. And if the size of the, threshold pa uh, size of the distress passes that threshold, passes that number, it becomes just a little larger than that number, the picture becomes dramatically different, meaning that more interconnectivity implies more fragility. So those two examples hopefully show a flavor of, of this result. So in some sense, it suggests that highly interconnected financial networks are very robust to small shocks, very robust to small distress, but are very fragile at, in the face of uh, large distress. In some sense, you can think that there is, they, they exhibit this knife edge property. So the same features that makes the financial system highly stable under regular conditions can make it function really badly under extreme distress. And that distress is basically knife edge. As soon as you pass it, the, the, the financial system becomes highly unstable. Okay, so that's our first result. And you know, just to give you a flavor of the intuition of what, why this is happening, you know, there in, in this very simple model, there are at least two shock, shock absorption mechanisms. One is the excess liquidity that each of these banks have, and the other one is the senior obligations that these banks have to the, to the outside world, to, to not the banks in the financial world. So in some sense, you can think about it that the highly interconnected financial network, they use the first mechanism really well, but they use the second, the second mechanism not as well. So when I have a lot of counterparties, all my losses are going to be divided between them, and if they have enough cash or resources, they'll be able to absorb those losses. Whereas they don't use the second mechanism as well. On the other hand, more sparsely connected networks, less interconnected financial systems, do not utilize one as much, but then they utilize the second mechanism more efficiently. That's why in the face of large shocks, these networks outperform those, whereas at the face of small shocks, those financial systems would outperform these financial systems. Okay? So that's sort of the intuition. And then, you know, there is a, we have one more result uh, in this paper. And that's that. So, so far I told you, let's take the financial system as given and then see what happens. But of course, banks, they just don't lend to one another randomly or out of <coughs> benevolence. You know, they have incentives in their lending behavior. Right? So what, we, what we're also interested uh, in understanding is that what are the implications of banks' incentives in the, in the type of financial networks that, that can arise? So again, I'm not going to give you the whole result, but just a, a flavor of what to expect. So let's look at, again, this very stylized example. And let's look at the decision of uh, the bank there, whether it wants to lend to, to the other one or not. What happens is that when a bank decides, when let's say bank one decides to lend to bank two, of course I know that this is a risky behavior because I would be facing a higher counterparty risk. Bank two may not be able to lend back to me. But what I'm not internalizing really is that when I lend, when I lend to Stefan, and not only this lending behavior is going to create risk for me, it's going to create risk for all my creditors as well. His failure would lead to my failure, but it would lead to the failure of my creditors as well. And that's not necessarily what I would take into account. Effectively, I'm not internalizing this negative externality on this other one. 
So one can say that they do not, the banks, this simple example suggests that you know, banks necessarily do not internalize the risk that they create on their credit. Of course, this depends on the type of the contracts that banks can write, but in general, if these contracts are not contingent on the structure of the whole financial network, of who's lending to who exactly, how much, in what terms, then we're gonna have these negative externalities and effectively we're gonna have an inefficient network structure. So you know, to summarize, one can think that banks' incentives may lead to overly fragile financial networks. Okay? So basically just to, give, to wrap up, what we do in this paper, we come up very, with a very stylized model of interbank lending and credit risk uh, and counterparty risk to see, to, to basically take a baby step towards understanding how the structure of the financial network would lead to contagion and, and stability. And what we find is that the financial networks have this robust yet fragile property that they're very robust at the face of small shocks when they're interconnected, but then they can be very fragile in the face of the large shocks. And then you know, there is market inefficiency in interbank lending. You can think about as financial stability as a public good, which is effectively underprovided. Now, of course, this is a very baby step. You know, other things that one might want to do is to see whether this mechanism has any empirical relevance. This is a basically a static view. One can take a more dynamic view as banks taking into account all these processes. And also, you know, there are a lot of other amplification or contagion mechanisms that I didn't talk about. And one final point is that these nominal effects that I mentioned in the co context of finance, really, they, they also exist in the real economy. So here is an anecdotal evidence, obviously, but if you remember back in 2008, the CEOs of Ford, GM, and Chrysler, they went to uh, the Congress asking for bailouts. The interesting part of the story was that in the testimony that the CEO of Ford, Alan Mullally, had in the Senate Banking Committee, he said that, look, we're in very good shape, but please bail out GM and Chrysler. We don't need your money, please bail out these two other guys. And his argument was that even though these guys are our biggest domestic competitors, we share 90% of our suppliers and 25% of our major dealers. So if one of these guys go under, it would lead to the failure of our so many of our suppliers that we would be in trouble as well. Basically, these dominoes would start falling. And then we would be in so much trouble in, if not within hours, within days. Maybe he was exaggerating, but probably there is some truth in that. Okay, so that's all I have. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you.